This podcast contains murder and mayhem, guts and gore, adult language, and sexual content. Exactly what you came here for. All the listener discretion is advised. Welcome. I am your mistress of the macabre, Sarah Tierra. Grab your Ouija board, light the candles, and grab your jar of human teeth because you and I are going to escape for a bit. Pour yourself a cocktail, pull the window shades closed, and find a cool, dark, quiet place. Because right now we delve into the macabre. Hello and welcome to the Mistress of the Macabre podcast. If it's your first time, welcome to the dark side. If not, welcome back. I'm your host, Sarah Tierra. I, oh my God, I have an embarrassing story that I would like to share with you. I was shooting an ad from my studio at home the other day, and I had all the lights up. So there's cords everywhere and there's lights everywhere. And I was moving a bar stool, like a big, tall stool. I had used it. I was putting it back and I'm like navigating with this heavy stool and the dog was laying in the doorway and I told him to move so I could go through the doorway with the stool and he wouldn't move. Next thing I know, I am on the ground, stunned, just like shook. I had somehow even though I was holding the stool in front of me and holding it up to get over the dog and I was trying to step over the dog, I somehow went backwards and rolled and landed on top of the stool with like my full big ass body weight. And I went down the hardest I've ever gone down in my entire life. I was just like sitting there on the floor in shock for like 20 minutes. I don't cry. I'm not a crier. Had I been a crier, I would have been bawling. The dog, of course, he doesn't know what to do. I've never like hurt myself around him before. And so he's just barking at me and chucking his ball at my face when I'm like trying to like get my bearings. He eventually realized it was serious and came and gave me hugs and kisses, but he was real annoying at the beginning. Anyways, so I have imprinted on my body the back of the entire bar stool in the form of a black bruise that starts on my butt cheek and goes all the way up to my middle back. And it's the curve of the top of a bar stool, like the backing of it. You could see the whole outline of it. And then right in the middle of it, there's a bloody hole. I am telling you, I've never hurt myself that bad. But I didn't lose a limb or a finger. And that's great. So we count our blessings on this show. Anyways, I was mortified and I'm glad that no one saw it, but it also makes me slightly terrified to live alone because the dog would just chuck his ball at me and he'd probably wait a good 30 minutes before he just started eating me if anything should happen. I also want to tell you guys right off the bat here, I am starting a new job and I am starting school. I cannot tell you how often I will be releasing episodes. I would love to tell you it's going to be weekly, but I don't think that that's going to be the case. I'm not going to stop doing the podcast. I love doing it and connecting with people that are like-minded. That was my number one goal. I just don't feel like I have found my people in this world and I would like to find them. So I will be continuing to do it. I don't know how fast I'm going to be able to read three books and write an episode, to be honest, because I've been able to do it in one week, but I don't think that'll be the case anymore. Anyways, I'll still be here. I just don't know when. My last thing I wanted to tell you guys is I did the maths which I'm very bad at, as we all know. And there is over six hours right now of bonus content, straight up true crime, nothing else, on Patreon, on the members only section of my website, and on Apple Podcast subscriptions. So if you like true crime and you want like the hard hitting cases and facts, then you should definitely check out my bonus episodes. And I will be continuing to crank those out as well, probably still on a weekly basis. Okay, now that all of that bullshit is out of the way, we are diving into part three of Killer Fashion and Beauty. You didn't think more people could die via fashion? You're incorrect. Lots more people are going to die. We are starting today with shirts. Accidents are usually unforeseen, instantaneous, and violent. As such, they are sensationalized or even glamorized by the press. 
Indeed, our contemporary risk-adverse society has an almost morbid fascination with reporting on, analyzing, and preventing accidents. Digital media allows us to disseminate horrific facts, images, and even videos of accidents around the world instantaneously. Facebook groups, I'm looking at you, because I joined a few and I left them. In previous centuries, in tribal, agricultural, or pre-industrial communities, accidents were in the hands of the gods. One could simply be unlucky or fated to die. In August 1559, for example, you remember that year, prime live-in, 1559. For example, George Rydoak had his shirt caught in his windmill's axle by a gust of wind, and the combination of clothing, rotating wheel, and breezy weather proved fatal. Rydoak was, quote, sore wounded, end quote, by the wheel, broke his arm and two ribs, and died. An official police report for a city in eastern France near Switzerland describes how Monsieur Jules Tournier, a 40-year-old laborer, was entangled and mutilated by a revolving drivetrain shaft. Line shafting and belts like the one Tournier fatally encountered had been used since the Industrial Revolution to distribute power to machines. Their swift, constant rotation was a frequent cause of accidents. Tournier's 19-year-old co-worker, Theophile, that's an unfortunate name, Paulus, recounted that at 6 o'clock in the morning of June 10, 1882, he and his dead friend climbed up onto a hangar to store planks. When finished, they had to pass under the turning shaft in order to get the ladder down, but Tournier did not bend down enough and, quote, was seized by his clothing and dragged around the shaft. As soon as I saw it, I cried, but it was too late. For in less than two or three minutes, his body was completely chopped up, end quote. The foreman for the factory of M.M. Vandal Freres said that, quote, the body of that unfortunate was in pieces on the ground, end quote, and when the police arrived, they found only his clothes still rolled around the shaft. The debris of his body had to be taken to the hospital. The police inspection concluded that great precautions had to be taken to avoid accidents since the shaft was only just three feet above the ground. Bending over sufficiently to get under it would have forced workers to crawl on their hands and knees. Although we usually associate men with industrial accidents, women worked in factories too. In fact, men perished in a range of different workplace accidents, whereas almost all female factory workers who died were killed by machinery. Fashionably long, female hair was a danger near drive shafts. It could easily become entwined. A 1906 report by Hilda Martindale, an early female civil servant, noted that, quote, the British inspectors observed scalping injuries from shafting, including one case where the knowledge of first aid was so poor the scalp was left in the drive shaft for an hour, end quote. That reminds me, I was watching Below Deck. I don't remember which one. There's like 10. Anyways, there was this female deckhand who was super cute and had this huge curly red hair. And the captain kept telling her to put her hair in a ponytail. And she was so mad. She was like, oh, is the ship going to sink if I don't put my hair in a ponytail? It's like, no, the anchor chain could like, your hair could get caught in it and it could scalp you. How do you not know that? How do you not know that you are potentially going to be scalped? I don't even work on a boat and I know that there are about 400 things on a boat that could scalp me. But then again, I'm a fucking weirdo. So I guess she didn't know that. Anyways, I digress. Another woman's clothing accident in a bone china factory was equally horrific. Quote, a poor woman engaged in feeding a bone mill had unfortunately approached so near the machinery as to get her clothes entangled in the wheels. The result was that she was drawn in and the flesh was literally pinched in large pieces by the remorseless machine from the thick part of her thighs. Eesh. An additional shade of melancholy is given to the circumstance by the fact that she was pregnant at the time, end quote. Whereas women's clothes, jewelry, and hair presented a disproportionate hazard in factories, historically men have been strangled by neckties and have had clothing like shirt cuffs snag on machinery, drawing fragile limbs and necks toward danger in seconds. Next up, we have corsets. 
Some trends are easier to follow than others. If cerulean blue comes into style, it's relatively easy to purchase a cerulean blue sweater. But what happens when a body shape becomes fashionable? We all live in it. We're all living in a horrendous Kardashian era. Hip to waist ratio isn't simply for sale. Well, if you have a lot of money, it is. Humans have long used clothing to change their silhouettes, exaggerating and accentuating different features. Depending on the era, trends have favored flattened or overflowing chests, cinched or straight waists, and flared or narrow hips. Starting in the late 16th century, people used to manipulate their waists by wearing a corset. The garment's stiff fabric was made even more rigid with whalebone and later metal, and it laced up like a running shoe. Though always fitted, the corset could also be tight-laced to dramatically compress the body and deliver a startlingly smaller waist. Corsets weren't just wildly popular, they were also controversial. From the moment they came into style, experts have blamed them for all kinds of ailments, physical, mental, and social. Some have even accused the corset of murder. Starting in the 18th century, male doctors and the popular press shared overdramatic images of corsets harming and even killing women who supposedly laced them too tightly. Before many death by corset stories surfaced, critics against these garments voiced their negative opinions of them. For instance, in 1844, the Dublin Weekly Herald stated, quote, Corset lacing, as practiced in Europe and America, is in truth no other than an impious, murderous, suicidal fashion. Impious because it undertakes to give the female a better shape than the Lord intended her. Murderous because parents are often the cause of the fatal disease of the children. Suicidal because vast numbers continue to wear corsets after they know they materially injure them. End quote. The problems caused by the evil corset and the health dangers associated with such a garment was also reported in 1874 in the Claire Freeman and Ennis Gazette. Quote, there is no doubt that a corset's tight lacing has a very injurious effect on the females who practice it, compressing the abdominal and thoracic viscera till their normal action is impeded and their functions impaired. Even from the point of view of effect, the practice is an ill-advised one, wearer of the corset generally incurring the eternal signs of a cramped liver with its concomitants of a red and pinched nose, a jaundiced complexion, and an icteric eye. The hourglass, which seems the model of elegant form to so many of the fair sex, should rather suggest warning than imitation, end quote. While many 19th century women heard about the health problems associated with corsets, no one expected the fashionable corsets to be linked to deaths. Yet that is exactly what happened. Women died. These death by corset incidences were often attributed to the corset lacings being too tight and doctors eagerly publicized such stories. For example, one physician, a Dr. Embleton, who practiced in London, reported, quote, he had known deaths to have occurred from tight lacing and he urged ladies to abstain from the most ridiculous and disfiguring fashion, end quote. The coroner for Central Middlesex, Dr. Danford Thomas, reported in 1881 that he was personally cognizant of four or five women dying from wearing tightly laced corsets. A New York physician, E.Y. Robbins, went a step farther. He alleged that death by corset cases were much higher than people imagined because, quote, in the year 1859, 10,195 females died of consumption to 5,640 males, end quote. Robbins then stated that the difference was owing mainly to the tight lacing of corsets. Newspapers also reported on corset deaths regularly. They also frequently warned corset wearers of the dangers of lacing them too tightly. For instance, in Kentucky in 1868, a warning from Louisville Daily Courier was given to all ladies telling them about what could happen if they laced their corsets too tight. Quote, a young lady dropped dead in the street last Sunday and the coroner found that she had killed herself by tight lacing. Deaths from this cause are more common than many suppose, end quote. 
Another death by corset story involved a young unnamed American victim. This story was published in 1871 in the Wellington Independent and stated that the victim was from Arkansas and, quote, described as 13 years old, shoeless, bonnetless, stockingless, with the sheriff after her for stealing a horse, end quote. Why you would put a corset on when you didn't put on shoes or a hat? I don't know. In 1870, there was a well-publicized death by corset case in England. A Dr. Lancaster held an inquest in Clerkenwell after a 21-year-old domestic servant named Jemima Hall died. According to reports, she had suddenly taken ill with complaints about, quote, pains inside, end quote. A doctor was called. He saw her that day and the next, but could find no reasonable causes for her illness. When he called on the third day, he found her dead. That resulted in an investigation to determine why she died. Quote, a post-mortem examination was then made by the coroner's order, and it was found that the whole of the organs of the body were contracted and out of their places. Her stomach was smaller than that of an ordinary infant, and her heart only weighed four ounces. Death arose from congestion of the lungs and brain, the result of tight lacing, a practice which the young woman, who was of prepossessing appearance, had long preserved in. End quote. I'm just going to say it. A lot of these death by corset incidences seem to have been something else. Like the girl running from the cops probably got heat stroke. The one we just talked about, her heart didn't weigh four ounces because she was wearing a corset. To me, that sounds like a pre-existing congenital defect of some sort. And maybe her organs were smaller. Maybe they didn't develop properly. And that is, none of these really ring true to me. It seems a bit dramatic and it seems perfectly explainable by other health complications. Another death by corset story happened in 1844 to 22-year-old Jane Goodwin. In Goodwin's case, she was attending church services when she suddenly became ill. Parishioners quickly carried her to the nearby Sexton's house, but within moments of her arrival there, she died. It was stated that the cause of her untimely death was that her corset was laced too tightly. Probably another heat stroke. Another 22-year-old death by corset victim lived in Bristol, England. Her story happened in 1851, the same year that Marie Antoinette's daughter, Marie Therese of France, died. According to the coroner, a Mr. Grindon, the 22-year-old's death, quote, was caused or at least much accelerated by the pernicious practice of tight lacing, end quote. Pernicious is a word we need to bring back. His postmortem and medical testimony showed that she was disease free, quote, except the compression of the stomach and viscera from tight lacing, end quote. Therefore, the jury returned as their verdict that the death was caused by idiopathic asphyxia hastened by tight lacing. I mean, but who can really say? Basically, in the Victorian period, if you sneezed while you were taking a shit, that equals death. So. There's no way to really know, but these all seem a little sus to me as a medical doctor. Just kidding. I'm not a medical doctor. I just think I am. I'm just kidding. I do not think I'm a medical doctor. I know I am. A similar story involved a 14-year-old servant girl with the last name Poole. She had been frequently warned against lacing her corset too tight. She did not listen, and when she finally died at Doncaster in 1851, it was reported that her death was caused from, quote, inflammation of the stomach and general disease of the viscera, and in consequence of the evidence given by the surgeon who made a post-mortem examination, the coroner's jury returned the verdict that the deceased's death had been greatly accelerated, if not altogether caused, by tight lacing, end quote. In 1888, another death by corset report involved a Detroit woman named Mary Crawford. She died two days before her wedding. According to the article, Crawford was in the middle of dancing when she collapsed and shortly afterwards died. Quote, an examination revealed the fact that her death was due to tight lacing because her corset had been drawn so tightly that the exertion of dancing had caused the bursting of a blood vessel, end quote. Perhaps one of the most well-publicized and interesting death by corset cases happened on December 26, 1894. 
Actress Kitty Terrell and her actor husband, Harry Ewins, were performing in Dick Whittington and His Cat at the Elephant and Castle Theatre in London. That was the most ridiculously Victorian British sentence I have ever said. It was the first show of the season, and after completing Act 2, Kitty barely made it off stage before she collapsed. Her husband was called, and when he arrived at her side, she cried before passing out. Good God. Oh, Harry, do unfasten my stays. I'm dying. End quote. An unconscious Kitty was then carried to a dressing room, her corset unlaced, and salts given. Unfortunately, she could not be revived, and by the time the doctor arrived, he announced there was nothing he could do. Kitty had died. The audience, of course, knew nothing of the tragedy playing out backstage because the show continued without a hint that anything was wrong. The show must go on, darling. In fact, even Ewins performed as expected. Apparently, he loved the theater a lot more than he loved his wife. Kitty's inquest was held at Newington a few days later. It was probably no surprise to anyone when the coroner announced that Kitty's corset had been laced too tightly. He noted that the tight lacings likely aggravated her existing heart condition, making her unable to get enough oxygen and therefore causing her to die of asphyxia. Learning about the harm caused by corsets resulted in critics establishing movements and crusades to do away with them. So, for instance, by 1899, Russia had banned against women wearing such garments, and around the same time, Parisian women also attempted to abolish corsets in their country. Religious observers found them unacceptable too and decried that corset wearers were committing a moral sin because it taught them the art of deception and artificiality. In 1873, Elizabeth Stuart Phelps Ward, an early American feminist, also argued against corset wearing when she declared, quote, Burn up the corsets. No, nor do you save the whale bones. You will never need whale bones again. Make a bonfire of the cruel steels that have lorded it over your thorax and abdomens for so many years and heave a sigh of relief. For your emancipation, I assure you, from this moment, has begun. End quote. Despite the health warnings and despite the numerous death by corset stories, some 19th century people saw these garments as a good thing and ignored the warnings. Supporters maintained that wearing a corset was a good thing. They argued that it should not be outlawed or abolished, and, in fact, advocates asserted the choice of wearing a corset should be left up to the individual, resulting in a newspaper concluding, quote, The war upon the corset has commenced. Fierce will be the struggle, and we cannot guarantee success to the attacking party. It does seem absurd that people should worry so much over their next-door neighbors. If a woman chooses to harm herself, that is her own lookout. No one has any right to interfere, much less the state at large. Most things in life are a mixture of good and evil. The corset worn in moderation is good. Worn to excess, it is evil. End quote. Very tight corsets can cause shortness of breath because the lower parts of the lungs are unable to fully expand and contract. Constant corset wear can permanently deform the still growing bones of a young person. However, the ribs of fully grown adults will return to place once the garment is removed. Listen, if Dita Von Teese is still alive after 47 years of corseting, I think it's fine. Corsets became news again in 2016 when reality TV family The Kardashians were paid to promote a line of waist trainers. Their social media posts claimed that the products would radically reduce your waist size. Even though waist trainers have been medically proven to be a waste of money, the hashtag waist training has appeared upward of a million times on Instagram as of 2018. And next up, we have everybody's favorite hair accessory, lice. One in 10 kids ends up itchy with head lice at one time or another. These bugs are annoying, but they won't kill you. The same cannot be said for head lice's bigger, badder cousins, body lice. Body lice live and lay eggs in the seams of clothing where it's nice and cozy and move to the body for mealtimes. While they feed off their host's blood, they have a nasty habit of leaving behind a dangerous disease, which is typhus. We all know it. We all love it. It's typhus. 
Typhus is a bacterial infection that causes fever, muscle aches, and aggressive rashes, eventually leading to the fatal swelling of the heart and brain. It spreads fastest when people are crowded together, which is most common during times of famine and war. During these times, the number of deaths due to typhus has vastly outnumbered deaths by starvation and combat. Of all the ways clothes can be deadly, providing a home for body lice is by far the deadliest. In the winter of 1812, starving, exhausted soldiers from Napoleon's already shattered Grand Armée, stupid, he would name his army the Grand Armée, what a twat, knelt down in fetal positions to die, heads bowed, freezing where they fell. Their bodies were unceremoniously dumped into a mass grave. Almost 200 years later, construction workers in Vilnius, the capital of Lithuania, discovered the mass grave. During Napoleon's 1812 retreat from Russia, tens of thousands of his men became feverish. They passed through Vilnius on their retreat, and a mere 3,000 of the 25,000 soldiers who reached that city are thought to have survived. Using modern DNA analysis techniques, Techniques and the science of paleomicrobiology, a team of archaeologists and historical epidemiologists, ooh, that'd be a fun job, proved the existence of typhus and trench fever in these soldiers' tooth pulp. Ugh, tooth stuff. Although many of the soldiers succumbed to simple cold and starvation, almost a third of the sample of soldiers tested were infected with these louse-borne diseases, illnesses that would have killed the already weakened soldiers. Because we now know that the feces of body lice transmitted bacteria that caused these deadly epidemics, the archaeological team made a special effort to sift for the tiny insects in the soil of the gravesite, pioneering techniques for extracting genetic material from the parasites, which revealed that their bodies still carried disease after two centuries. That is terrifying. This species of body louse, pediculus humanus humanus, which is distinct from head and pubic lice, hid in the seams of garments like the uniform jacket of an officer of the horse artillery of the Imperial Guard that they unearthed at the site. They bit their hosts until they became too hot and feverish, at which point they found another body to infest and infect. With literally entire armies of unwashed soldiers sleeping and living in close, dirty quarters, they did not have very far to look. Although the connection between vermin and disease was not scientifically understood yet, typhus and a related disease called trench fever were historically called jail or ship fever. These diseases broke out when many bodies were crowded together in spaces like prisons and boats. Before antibiotics, illnesses like typhus and typhoid fever were lethal to soldiers. And statistically, parasites have caused more deaths than weapons in drawn-out battles like the Napoleonic Wars and the Crimean War. In the early 20th century, 10 to 60% of people infected by epidemic typhus died. Called cooties in American military slang, Body lice are responsible for the expression to feel lousy or horrible. Proper laundering of clothing was not possible on military campaigns, and soldiers often paid the price with their lives. Typhus was a serious problem in the trenches of World War I, but common soldiers knew to regularly de-louse their uniforms. A World War I postcard shows a topless French soldier sitting at the side of the trench hunting for lice. Another, probably American, hand has scrawled on the card in purple ink, indicating the trenches and the subject matter of the image. Quote, this bird is killing cooties, end quote. Hunched over his white shirt, he painstakingly handpicks lice out of it, a process depicted in many other photographs and postcards of the period. Cultural norms also influenced the perception of vermin. The French poil, or infantry soldier, actually considered the body louse a good luck charm. One erotic postcard shows a uniformed French soldier on leave from the trenches, in bed with his sweetheart. The next morning, she looks down at the bodice of her frilly, beribboned nightdress, finds the louse he gave her, and exclaims, Thank goodness, it brings good luck. Disgusting. 
The bacterial link between body lice and typhus was not made until 1909. Charles Nicolet, a French bacteriologist who won the Nobel Prize for his discovery, described body lice as a parasite that accompanied men on all their travels and halted only on, quote, the doorstep of hospitals or where men encountered water, soap, and clean linen. End quote. Although steam and hot air were the most effective means of killing lice, there were rarely proper facilities or fuel on the front. Some officers turned to chemicals to disinfect uniforms. Unfortunately, these chemicals were toxic not only to lice but also to humans, and thus chemical warfare came to be waged against both the opposing army and insect enemies behind the lines. A British team made up of an entomologist and a pharmacologist was trying to solve the louse problem in the trenches. They suggested the use of at least six chemicals tested against lice during the Great War. Their list included lethal hydrogen cyanide, which was later used in Nazi gas chambers. Their favorite chemical, however, was chloropicrin. It was a highly toxic agent used in gas attacks by the Germans starting in 1917. They warned that because it irritated the eyes, nose, and throat and was poisonous, the operator should wear a gas mask when fumigating clothing. They applauded the chemical's convenience because, quote, as chloropicrin is used in gas warfare, a supply should be available on the fighting front. End quote. Despite these measures, lice were still a torture for soldiers, especially at night when they became active and bit with sharp stabs that became horrendously itchy wounds. One soldier said about the torturous need to scratch his body, quote, you feel like you could tear yourself to pieces, end quote. A 1918 song called The March of the Cooties, or Those Sneaky Creepy Cooties, captured the constant and losing battle soldiers fought against body lice. Despite this humorous mockery in musical form, typhus and trench fever were still horrific in the early 20th century. Medical texts describe the ways in which body louse lived on the body hair and clothing next to the skin with the eggs or knits in clusters, and often deeply embedded in seams and folds of the clothing. Experts suggested that male soldiers should have their body hair shaved and be given a weekly change of clean clothing to prevent infestation. Typhus and many forms of diseased dress spread death and disease by accident, circumstance, or neglect. However, infected cloth was also used in active germ warfare. Although modern vaccination techniques have ensured that there have been no major smallpox epidemics since the late 1970s, current medical research demonstrates that the virus can live in textiles for more than a week. Long before germ theories of disease transmission, folk knowledge of fabric as a carrier of disease explains the infamous British use of smallpox blankets and linens in strategic germ warfare. Blankets brought European-made goods into personal and intimate bodily contact with First Nations populations. The correspondence between Jeffrey Amherst, the commander-in-chief of the North American forces, and Colonel Henry Bouquet, the commander at Fort Pitt, is particularly damning. Amherst, who made no secret of his hatred for native populations, suggested that giving blankets from the smallpox hospital at the fort would adequately do away with them for good. Independently of Amherst's urgings, the officers at the fort had already laid aside rules of soldierly conduct and put this tactic into practice. At a supposedly peaceful parley with the head warrior Turtleheart and Chief Mamalti at Fort Pitt on June 24, 1763, the indigenous peoples assured the British that, quote, they would hold fast of the chain of friendship, end quote. Gifts were normally exchanged as a sign of goodwill to seal agreements, but in this case, officers used the occasion to betray native leaders by giving them, quote, two blankets and a handkerchief out of the smallpox hospital, end quote, in the hope that, quote, it would have the desired effect, end quote. I know. Let's just take a breath. It's horrible. It's fucking horrible. Every single thing we have ever done to the indigenous peoples. And this is what I think about every Thanksgiving, because that whole story of sitting down peacefully was bullshit. We were giving them smallpox and stealing their land. 
and telling children an inaccurate history. And I don't think about it only on Thanksgiving. I think about this all the time. I hate it. It's horrific. Historical evidence suggests that smallpox had already broken out among the Delawares before the blankets were given to them. However, it was deceitful and fucking horrific to use these biological weapons in a supposedly peaceful exchange. Unlike 18th century Europeans who came from countries where the disease was endemic and the populace had developed immunity to it, First Nations peoples were devastated by smallpox. For these reasons, the smallpox blanket incident at Fort Pitt is still a source of public outrage. I am outraged. I am the public and I am outraged. Whether they served their lethal purpose or not, blankets that were ostensibly given as a sign of friendship became murder weapons. Before the rise of germ theory in the second half of the 19th century and discoveries like Nicolet's, writers did not always distinguish between chemical substances and contagious diseases. Both were just known as poisons. Contagion is etymologically related to the idea of physical contact and means to touch together. Since the 14th century, it has also been used to describe the circulation of ideas, beliefs, and practices were considered contagious. Fashion trends have been portrayed as viral. New styles spread rapidly through populations like fevers or viruses. A Victorian prime minister, Sir Robert Peel, gave his daughter a riding habit as a gift. Side saddle riding habits were prestigious tailored sportswear appropriate for the equestrian pursuits of the truly wealthy. She contracted typhus and died on the eve of her wedding. The Regent Street tailor had sent it out to be finished in the house of an impoverished seamstress who had used the warm woolen skirt to cover her sick, shivering husband. The garment carried the disease, quote, from the hovel of the poorest to the palace of the statesman, end quote. Typhus could contaminate wearers across the social spectrum, hiding in both bespoke or custom-tailored garments and the cheaper ready-mades that were starting to flood the market in the mid-19th century. Lice did not discriminate. Our forebears were forced to think of and respond to the dangers lurking in their clothing, but modern epidemiology, antibiotic treatments, and techniques for easy laundering and dry cleaning have made us less suspicious of clothing's potential to spread contagious disease. Although it still affects disadvantaged, homeless, and refugee populations, we are no longer afraid of typhus in our sweatshop-produced brand-new navy peacoat from The Gap. Do they go out of business? I feel like every store from that era went out of business, right? Express, The Gap... I think they're all gone now. I don't know. Brand new clothing was not the only danger. Historically, cloth was precious and was resold and recycled until it ended its life as a cotton rag paper. Even though machine spinning and weaving brought down the cost of textiles, in the 1800s, many were forced to buy secondhand clothes from dealers and street sellers. They could not know whether their purchases had been worn by sick or dying people. Doctors like E. Gilbert, who was an employee of the Paris Lyon Marseille train line, argued in 1879 that soldiers returning from Africa brought viruses like smallpox back to France and that laundresses spread disease to the general population. He said that the secondhand rag and clothing trades, however, were the worst culprits and called for the government to set up central depots to disinfect contagious merchandise. He wanted attention focused on the internal, quote, trade in old rags, linen, cloths, tattered cloth of all kinds, which may not bring us the plague, but which freely spreads smallpox, scarlet fever, measles, scabies, etc., End quote. Unsanitary urban conditions and insufficient laundering, along with social mores that required men, women, and children to cover the body from head to toe in multiple layers of cloth, contributed to parasitic and textile-related skin diseases, especially eczema and dermatitis. While there had long been a popular understanding that the clothing of the sick should be burned— Germ theory, pioneered by doctors like Louis Pasteur in the early 1860s, we will get to it in a different episode, made an irrefutable scientific link between contaminated clothing and disease. 
Pasteur's discoveries spurred a deluge of literature on on disinfecting linens and clothes. Public health policies were put in place to hygienically launder clothing in army barracks, hospitals, and other large institutions. Civilians began to fear germs in the home as well. A couple more really brief mentions of typhus outbreaks in history during wartime. I'm going to go over them super quickly here. The Granada War, 1482 to 1492. Though typhus is likely an ancient affliction, the earliest recorded outbreak was during the final battle of this 10-year war. The King of Aragon, now a part of Spain, lost a total of 20,000 soldiers, 3,000 killed by the enemy, and 17,000 by typhus. Irish Migration, 1847. In 1847, at the height of the potato famine, close to 110,000 Irish men, women, and children fled starvation in their homeland by packing themselves onto ships and sailing to Canada. The overcrowded coffin ships, as they were called, were ideal breeding grounds for lice. In a single year, nearly 20,000 newly arrived Irish would die from typhus. The Ethiopian Famine, 1983 to 1985. After record low rainfalls caused total crop failure in northern Ethiopia, the government tried to stem the spreading of starvation by moving everybody south. The mass migration led to overcrowding and made it difficult to wash clothes, the perfect conditions for body lice. In addition to brutal famine, Ethiopia suffered 14,000 cases of typhus, the most significant outbreak since the Second World War. The First World War started soon after Nicoel's discovery, leading to one of the most devastating typhus epidemics in history. As many as 30 million people in Eastern Europe succumbed to the disease. Thankfully, we now have a treatment for typhus. Even so, the most powerful preventative is the washing machine. Moving on to dyes. Arsenic green. In 1775, chemist Carl Wilhelm Scheele invented an exceptionally vibrant green pigment that was applied to clothing, wallpaper, toys, and even candy. This particular pigment has gone by a few names over the years. Emerald green, Paris green, Scheele's green, and as a nod to one of its original ingredients, arsenic green. Another name it goes by is Poisonous Green. Calling all my Bobby Darren fans out there for this next story. On November 20th, 1861, Matilda Schurer, a 19-year-old artificial flower maker, died of accidental poisoning. All day long, she constructed wreaths of artificial flowers for fashionable ladies to wear in their hair. Matilda dusted green powdered pigment onto fake leaves with her bare hands. The formerly healthy and, quote, good-looking, end quote, young woman worked for Mr. Bergeron in central London along with a hundred other employees. She fluffed artificial leaves, dusting them with an attractive green powder that she inhaled with every breath and ate off her hands at each meal. The brilliant hue of this green pigment, which was used to color dresses and hair ornaments, was achieved by mixing copper and highly toxic arsenic trioxide, or white arsenic as it was known. The toxic green dust ruined the hands and bodies of flower workers. In a workshop or factory environment, it was ground under fingernails and eaten off of dirty hands. It blistered toes peeping from holes in worn shoes and settled on floors where it killed rats and mice. At night, workers carried the powder home on their clothing. The press described her death in grisly detail, and by all accounts, Schurer's final illness was horrible. She vomited green waters, the whites of her eyes had turned green, and she told her doctor that everything she looked at was green. In her final hours, she had convulsions every few minutes until she died, with, quote, an expression of great anxiety, end quote and foaming at the mouth, nose, and eyes. An autopsy confirmed that her fingernails had turned a very pronounced green, and the arsenic had reached her stomach, liver, and lungs. To the non-medical public, it seemed that Schurer's death was predictable and entirely preventable, and that her life had been cruelly sacrificed to wealthy women's desire for fashionable adornments. 
The story alarmed the members of an organization called the Ladies' Sanitary Association. One member, a Mrs. Nicholson, visited the workshops where flowers were made and had published a shocking firsthand account of following, quote, half-clad and half-starved little girls with bandaged hands, end quote, as they pick up an order of leaves and turn it into bouquets. Nicholson wrote that one of the girls stubbornly refused to work anymore. She had observed her fellow flower makers in the workshop wearing handkerchiefs soaked with blood, and she herself, quote, had been kept on working with green till her face was one mass of sores, end quote, and she was almost blind. Nicholson's article alerted her readers to the fact that the young female workers were ignorant of the nature and effects of arsenical greens and that, quote, imagine that it gives them a dreadful cold, end quote. The Ladies' Sanitary Association decided to hire Dr. A.W. Hoffman, an analytical chemist with a worldwide reputation, to figure out exactly what had happened. Hoffman shared his results with the public in a London Times article sensationally entitled The Dance of Death. The expert concluded that an average headdress contained enough arsenic to poison 20 people. The, quote, green tarlatans so much of late in vogue for ball dresses, end quote, contained as much as half their weight in arsenic, meaning a ball gown fashioned from 20 yards of this fabric would have 900 grains of arsenic. A Berlin doctor had also determined that, quote, from a dress of this kind, no less than 60 grains powdered off in the course of a single evening, end quote. Four or five grains were lethal for an average adult. Although wealthy women clad in green were fingered as murderers, it was privileged ladies from the same social class who had blown the whistle on the dangers of arsenical green dresses, calling on chemists to back up their claims. The tragic death of Matilda is the inspiration behind the song Artificial Flowers by crooner Bobby Darin, a rather jaunty song for the sad content of its lyrics. Honestly, it's a bob. Magazines publish drawings of dead dancers to warn people about the dangers of dressing in green. One 12-year-old girl who deliberately swallowed the green liquid she used in her Parisian workshop to commit suicide unfortunately demonstrated the pigment's deadly potential. Toxic green wreaths and poisoned flower makers made headlines, but in the 19th century, arsenic and the arsenicophobia it provoked were everywhere. This arsenious acid or white arsenic that went into pigments, rat poisons, and medicines was a cheap, colorless substance, a fine white powder obtained as a byproduct of mining and smelting metals like copper, cobalt, and tin. Arsenic was used by doctors to heal and by murderers to kill, accidentally finding its way into food and even beer. A child could buy it over the counter in a pharmacy. In Britain, acts like the Arsenic Act of 1868 were passed to limit the amounts that could be sold to individuals, but it was completely legal and unregulated for large-scale use in industry. Many hundreds of tons went into consumer products annually. Arsenic was considered an irritant poison in the 19th century. When it came into contact with the body, it functioned as a, quote, substance that exerts a caustic effect on the skin, producing sores, scabs, and sloughing of the damaged tissue. End quote. This is clear from the ulceration of the green hands with yellow nails illustrated in the redness and peeling of the skin around the nostrils and lips and deep white rimmed cancerous scars on a worker's leg that look almost like craters on the surface of the skin. Skin abrasions and wounds allowed further entry to the poison. Specific men were especially vulnerable. They dyed white cloth yellow with another irritant chemical dye called picric acid to create a more natural shade of green, brushed emerald green paste directly into the cloth with their bare forearms, and stretched it out to dry on wooden frames pierced with nails. The nails lacerated their hands and arms, allowing the poison to directly enter the bloodstream in what was called a constant inoculation with arsenic. When men urinated, arsenic on their hands caused painful inflammations and lesions on the scrotum and inner thighs that resembled syphilis. These injuries, which sometimes led to gangrene, could take six weeks of hospital bed rest to cure. After the cloth had been prepared by the men, the girls and young women turned it into leaves and bouquets. 
These female workers lacked appetite and were, quote, nauseous with colic and diarrhea, anemia, pallor, and constant headaches that made them feel as if their temples were being pressed in a vice, end quote. As a consequence, the French and German governments quickly passed legislation against these pigments. The British government took no action, and in 1860, only a year before Scherer's death, the British doctor Arthur Hill Hassall described the condition of flower workers in London as, quote, wretched in the extreme, end quote. These arsenical tints also harmed the hands of their wearers, if less gravely. As late as 1871, quote, a lady who purchased a box of green-colored gloves at a well-known and respectable house, end quote, suffered from repeated skin ulcerations around her fingernails until arsenical salts were detected. This was perhaps not surprising since trade manuals from the time suggest that some types of dyes were simply brushed directly on gloves in a liquid solution with no further treatment to fix the colors and leather gloves could easily leach the substance onto a person's warm, sweaty hands. Although we have forgotten these dangers, the conservative world of Parisian haute couture has a longer memory of them. Quote, Seamstresses don't like green, but I just don't think it's pretty. It isn't out of superstition. I am not superstitious at all, end quote. Said Madame Dominique, premier Maine in the draping studio at the House of Chanel, 2005. In the 2005 documentary, Seen Chanel, one of the most powerful women in the Chanel haute couture house, tells us that seamstresses don't like green. This anti-green stance has become a mythic, vague superstition linked with the fear of bad luck. Because the original Coco Chanel was so famous for her modernist black and white color palette, we have a hard time imagining her using natural shades like green for her dresses. Her successor, Karl Lagerfeld, himself attired in stark black and white, also does not like color. Yet Coco Chanel's avoidance of certain hues for her collections may not have been purely an aesthetic choice. As Scherer's death proves, fears or superstitions surrounding the color green in couture stem from concrete 19th century medical logic. Though the French had banned arsenical pigments in artificial foliage by this period, it still tinted myriad consumer items and was widely used in the marketing and packaging of fashion goods. Retailers used green or green-trimmed band boxes to sell, carry, and store accessories. Tests of identical green paper shoeboxes in the Bata Shoe Museum revealed substantial amounts of arsenic, and in 1880, a chemist in Scotland found extremely high levels of arsenic in boxes like these. Arsenical green wallpapers were also extremely dangerous to consumers. Unbeknownst to its purchasers, the pigment reacted with wallpaper glue and mold spores in damp climates like England and released lethal toxic hydrogen cyanide gas into the home. It is speculated that arsenic in dress may also have naturally volatilized. Andrew Miharg found arsenic in Victorian wallpapers, including those made by the luxury firm of arts and crafts designer William Morris. One Morris pattern called Trellis, which has red roses and green foliage, tested positive for arsenic in the foliage and mercury-rich vermilion in the roses. Despite its widespread use, arsenic in wallpapers was only beginning to be flagged as a health concern by the late 1830s, when products and bodies could be diagnostically tested for the poison. Toxicologists could not easily detect the presence of arsenic until the invention of the new tests. New technologies helped to convict murderers and identify and sometimes prosecute manufacturers and retailers of dangerous products. After the press had long been denouncing toxic colors in children's toys, candies, and a range of other consumer products, Victorians were understandably terrified. Doctors on the front line became detectives, sending samples of incriminated foods and consumer items for formal testing by professional chemists. Women doing the family shopping did not have access to their own laboratories, but chemists gave them helpful, if not worrisome, advice. In 1862, Henry Lethby of the London Hospital, a nationally renowned forensic expert in poisoning trials, and, quote, an extremely accurate technological chemist, 
end quote, suggested that the public use strong liquid ammonia on any article that worried them. Quote, if it turns blue, copper is present. And copper is rarely, if ever, present in these tissues and fabrics without arsenic being also present, the green being arsenite of copper, end quote. He had tested more than 100 dresses and papers in this way and noted that if women carried ammonia, quote, instead of the usual scent bottle, the mere touch of the wet stopper on the suspicious green would betray the arsenical poison and settle the business immediately. This is some fucking Sherlock Holmes grocery shopping housewife bullshit. Uh, That's kind of cool. Maybe it's not bullshit. It's crazy to think about, though. Can you even imagine? Dump out your perfume, honey, and load it up with liquid ammonia because you have to test every fucking thing that you come into contact with or you will die. Lethby's instructions imply that the problem was so widespread that Victorian women were invited to become amateur sleuths and toxicologists. Green received enough negative press that certain shades were shunned and eventually fell out of fashion. By the 1870s and 1880s, Henry Carr, a civil engineer who had published three editions of his popular book, Our Domestic Poisons, noted that the public recognized the specific tint and that consumers very commonly declared, this is not an arsenical green. Even after a non-toxic green dye was invented, no one wanted to wear it. Finally, in 1863, French Empress Eugenie wore a bright green gown to the opera. Just as today's media goes wild when a movie star wears an attention-grabbing dress to the Oscars, the 19th century press went crazy for it. After all the media coverage, people came around to the new safe hue named Nouveau Vert. Mauve, quote, One of the first symptoms by which the malady declares itself consists in the eruption of a measly rash of ribbons about the head and neck of the person who has caught it. The eruption, which is of a mauve color, soon spreads until, in some cases, the sufferer becomes completely covered with it. End quote. That is from an article entitled The Mauve Measles by Punch Magazine on August 20th, 1859. Like white arsenic, the toxic chemical benzene used to produce aniline dyes came from coal mining and its byproducts. Developments like gaslighting and heating derived from coal were spurred by shortages in natural lighting resources like whale oil and candle tallow in the first decades of the 19th century. Use of coal gas left large amounts of coal tar residue, a viscous black sludge. Chemists looked for other applications for this plentiful sludge, both medical and commercial, and while trying to synthesize quinine to cure malaria, the 18-year-old William Henry Perkins discovered that the black coal tar solution he was using dyed cloth purple. The hue, according to a popular magazine edited by none other than Charles Dickens, was, quote, rich and pure and fit for anything, be it fan, slipper, gown, ribbon, handkerchief, tie, or glove. It will lend luster to the soft, changeless twilight of ladies' eyes. It will take any shape to find an excuse to flutter round her cheeks, to cling, to her lips, to kiss her foot, to whisper at her ear, Perkins Purple, thou art a lucky and favored color. End quote. The erotically alluring mauve was born, and the chemist became a wealthy man. Purple was a popular color throughout the 19th century and frequently kissed women's feet. Flashy silk satin aniline mauve boots were all the rage in the 1860s, purchased by both British and French women. Not all publications, however, received mauve with the same warm welcome. Punch magazine humorously compared the rapid adoption of aniline mauve by every fashionable man, woman, and child in England in 1859 to a virulent outbreak of measles, a disease that causes bright purplish-red splotches on the skin. As mentioned earlier, writers adopted the medical language of contagion to describe mauve's rapid spread through the population, describing it as very catching. It suggested that hat and bonnet shops were infected places that should just now be marked as dangerous. While its ravages are principal 
principally among the weaker sex. Some men might have a milder form of the disease, but in general, one good dose of ridicule will cure it. Another journalist gave a less dire prognosis, calling it a mild fever and a gentle, fashionable insanity for Perkins Purple. As he looked out his window, he described how he saw the color everywhere. This way of describing the rapid and sometimes illogical spread of a fashion trend is still with us when we say that a certain image, video, or event has gone viral. Even though 19th century commentators observed how new dyes spread from one woman to another or migrated from the city to the countryside, this phenomenon is global, as are the chemical dye stuffs that still color our clothing. Early aniline colors were made more vibrant by using an arsonist acid dyeing process. The toxin was not always washed out in the final product and could be absorbed through the skin. The arsenic also leached into water and soil near dye factories, killing a woman near a French factory who was making magenta. An autopsy revealed arsenic in her organs, which had poisoned the well she drew her water from. In order to make the same magenta, which was the height of fashion in 1860, Perkins' own factory used mercuric nitrate, the same solution that carroted felt fur hats. He had to discontinue its use. Like the Hatters, his own workers were being poisoned by the solution. The pace of innovation increased during the second half of the 19th century, and chemists played with formulations and chemical families to achieve a particular shade of blue or scarlet that was in style. The speed of change left civilian and military doctors, toxicologists, and even veterinarians scrambling to understand the chemical compositions of particular shades that were causing health problems. In the case of a reddish orange dye called Coraline, toxicologists conducted horrific but seemingly conclusive experiments. In order to prove that Coraline was poisonous, they distilled red from an incriminated pair of socks with boiling alcohol and did something terrible to animals that I'm not going to say. And all of the test subjects died. Observations over years and decades showed that men in the dye works became ill with acute and chronic aniline poisoning or anilinism. Although it had always been a hazardous occupation, by the dawn of World War II, the precise dangers of the job were well known. Dyeing used, quote, a great variety of, of toxic substances as coloring, bleaching, and fixing agents, end quote. Chromium, or chrome as it was called at the time, was extensively employed in leather tanning and dyeing in the early 20th century. It bored deep chrome holes in workers' hands, nicknamed nightingales, because they were so painful they made those affected sing out like birds at night. An image from a treatise on occupational skin diseases graphically demonstrates the painful rash that chrome vapor produced on the arms and neck of a man who dyed stockings. Another treatise shows workers squeezing down from yarn by hand with no protective gloves and calls dyeing dirty work at best. The author noted workers in this industry suffered from respiratory illnesses like bronchitis, skin irritations like eczema, anemia, and cyanosis, known as the blues by workers in the trade, which was a sign of oxygen deprivation and turned lips and extremities blue. Aniline also caused a high number of bladder and testicular cancers. One would expect women who became the chromatic peacocks of the 19th century to suffer from a disproportionate number of aniline poisonings. Yet some of the worst cases of dye intoxication were of children and full-grown men. Middle and upper-class Victorian women were expected to be sedate, graceful, and sedentary compared to their more active masculine and juvenile counterparts. Men and children who worked, walked, or ran, even during hot weather, perspired, sometimes profusely, into their shirts, socks, shoes, and even hat bands. Recent academic studies done with the Adidas Innovation Team have proven that men sweat most on the lower back and forehead, and that they sweat almost twice as much as women during exercise. 
Emerald green and the new rainbow of aniline dyes had rarely been worn next to the skin. However, red had long been a popular color for men's and children's socks, women's stockings, flannel undergarments, petticoats, and the shirts worn by working class men. Traditional red dyes made from plants like matter root and insects like beetles may have deterred pests like moths from eating red wool, but they were color fast and safe for the skin. Red, quote, was frequently frequently worn next to the skin by preference and marketed as anti-rheumatic or recommended by doctors. Radium. In the first two decades of the 20th century, before the dangers of radiation were fully understood, there was a fashionable craze for radium. Nobody outside the scientific community paid much attention to the Nobel Prize in Physics before 1903, when, for the first time, the award went to a woman. Marie Curie's prize-winning discovery was a total media sensation. She had identified a mysterious new element that glowed load and produce heat as if from nowhere. She called it radium. Marie Curie was considered such a hero that she was put on a French stamp. Her laboratory can still be visited in Paris today. Don't worry, it's decontaminated. The mysterious glowing element discovered by Marie Curie was thought to impart vitality, vigor, and virality. This miraculously healthy substance cost more than platinum, and manufacturers used, or claimed to use, the precious element in an astounding range of consumer products, including deadly radium wristband watches, water jars, face creams, paint used on light switches, and glowing eyes for toy dolls and animals, and even condoms. That's right. Who doesn't want to use a radium condom? So warming. The U.S. Federal Trade Commission even banned radium products that had insufficient radioactive properties to justify their claims. Textiles like Oradium wool and Tradia brand knitted underwear were advertised as perfect for baby sweaters that emit a soft and healthy heat. A woolen radium brand blanket made in England and purchased in Canada seems to date back to the 1920s and may have been used at a hospital or sanitarium to treat patients. The fact that a warm, comforting object was marketed as healthfully radioactive is fucking crazy to us now. Companies put the radium name on any product they thought would sell. Razors, chocolate, perfume, children's books, and more. There was even a hit song called The Radium Dance. When researchers discovered that radium could help destroy cancer tumors, the health industry joined in the promotional frenzy. The element was considered a cure-all medical miracle. In 1928, that would change. Radium, as it turned out, was quite deadly. Radium was so outrageously expensive, it cost six thousand times more than gold that companies falsely claimed their goods contained the element. In an effort to protect consumers, the government fined anyone who exaggerated the amounts of radium being used in anything they sold. For a price, Marie Curie's own laboratory would confirm the radium content, literally stamping products with her approval. Here are some wearable radium-containing products you could buy at the start of the 20th century. Century. Lano Radium. The makers of this brand of wool suggested using their product to knit baby clothes and underwear, claiming the radioactivity had undeniable hygienic value. Radior. This British company's best selling product was a pad sprinkled with radium, which customers strapped to their chins in the hopes that it would eradicate wrinkles. Thoradia. This company marketed its lipstick as a scientific beauty product and promised its toothpaste, powder, and soap would give customers a brighter smile and glowing complexion. Instead, their faces fell off. The Radium Girls. This story is so horrible, and it is such a tale that I might devote an entire episode to it in the future. However, since we're talking about radium, we definitely have to cover this. I am going to give you an abbreviated rundown. In 1914, the fastest way to tell time was to check your wristwatch. This option was limited to daylight hours, of course. It was pretty hard to see a watch in the dark. That is, until the invention of Undark brand radium paint. 
Lit up with a greenish-white glow, a radium-painted watch could tell you the time, even in the dark. Hundreds of American teenage girls, many as young as 14, worked in factories painting these watches. Women and even teenage girls spent long days painting alarm clocks and watch faces with glowing, lethal radium. The clock faces were very small, and a sharp brush was essential for producing the required fine lines. The young women were taught to shape the radium-covered bristles on their tongues and lips. They were assured the paint was safe, and they each completed an average of 250 watches a day. Sometimes they would even play with the radium, giving their fingernails, teeth, and eyelashes a brilliant glow with a few coats. They would sprinkle it in their hair and go out dancing at night, glowing in the dark. They were not warned about dangers and did not suspect problems until they began to suffer severe symptoms, including anemia, radium jaw, or the deterioration of the jawbone, and deadly cancerous tumors. Oh, I also want to throw in there that these girls that are 14 years old are making money. Like, they're working, they are making good money, they're going out at night, they're like, everyone wanted to work at these factories. You know, it's a come up. So they think everything is amazing until they start getting sick. The first to fall seriously ill was Molly Magia. No one was able to figure out why. Her teeth were pulled in hopes of stopping the spread of infection, but her jawbone literally crumbled into dust when the dentist touched it. They knew that it was hopeless. Uh, I'm trying not to gag. Teeth stuff. Jawbone stuff? No. I thought teeth stuff was bad enough. That is fucking horrific. Maggie had died on September 12th, 1922, five years after she had started working at a watch factory. She was 24 years old. More women's teeth began to fall out. The U.S. Radium Corporation, where Maggie had worked, refused to accept responsibility for anyone's illness. They would continue the denial for years, even though their own secret investigations had turned up conclusive evidence that radium was most certainly harming their workers. It was only when a male employee died that an autopsy was done. The doctors learned that the body mistakes radium for calcium, and when ingested, the toxic substance ends up in the bones. These young women were being destroyed from the inside by what would come to be called radium poisoning. Maggie's co-worker, Grace Fryer, was 18 when she started painting watches at the factory. Years later, in a new job, she was showing signs of radium poisoning. She knew what was ahead of her, having seen many of her co-workers succumb to the illness. She wanted to hold the company accountable for its negligence, but even more, she wanted to warn the women still putting radium in their mouths every day. With four other workers, she decided to sue. The 1928 court case attracted massive national press attention, spreading word across the country of the women's stories and the risks of radium. They won their case. It was the first time that courts had ever held a company responsible for the health of its employees. Soon after, the national government established life-saving laws. These five young women, dubbed the Radium Girls by the press, changed history. I'm getting choked up. When they died, all before the age of 30, they had to be buried in lead caskets. Their bodies remain radioactive to this day. Radium is now banned from consumer products, but you never know where radioactive materials will turn up. In 2012, a black leather belt decorated with 801 metal studs sold by online clothing retailer ASOS set off bomb control sensors at the U.S. border. The metal contained enough radioactive cobalt to cause health problems if worn for more than 500 hours. ASOS turned over its inventory, which is currently confined to a protective storage facility. And that is where we're going to end for part three. We have one more episode to go in this series. We have a lot more horrific poisoning deaths and accidents and other horrible things to cover next week. So definitely tune in for the conclusion. But 
before we go. Nature. It's fucking cool. The strawberry squid is gorgeous. She's a supermodel. She looks like Linda Evangelista. She is pink and she seems to shimmer when rays of light hit her underwater. Actually, in some photos, she looks like she is adorned in rhinestones. Swarovski Avi. She also has one large eye and one small one. Quirks are what make us endearing. This squid's mismatched eyes are actually the perfect pair. Together, this improbable pair helps the squid hunt for food in the ocean's twilight zone. The big left eye looks upward to spot shadows cast by prey in the dimly lit waters above. The eye's tubular shape helps collect as much light as possible. Often, this eye has a yellow lens to see through the luminescent camouflage of its prey. The squid's right eye is small and looks downward. This eye searches for flashes of bioluminescence produced by prey or predators lurking in the darker waters below. This squid is sometimes called the cockeyed squid for the remarkable difference in size between its two eyes, which I think is just plain rude. Food is scarce in the deep sea, so animals must evolve unique strategies to find it. They must also find ways to avoid becoming food. Like many deep sea animals, the strawberry squid is bright red. Red light does not reach the deep sea. There, a crimson coloration actually appears black and helps the squid hide from the gaze of predators like sperm whales, dolphins, tuna, swordfish, and sharks. Small light organs called photophores also dot the squid's body Body to help mask its silhouette from predators prowling the waters below. The squid's vernacular name arose due to its rich red skin pigmentation and the presence of photophores along its body, making it appear like a strawberry with seeds. The strawberry squid lives in the ocean's mesoplegic zone and are found in the California Current and the Humboldt Current. Little is known about their specific feeding and mating behaviors, although their inking patterns have been subject to study. They are not easily disturbed and only ink when provoked. The strawberry squid has a very high concentration of photophores. They are more dense near the anterior head region of the squid and become smaller and farther apart near the posterior end. It is the only squid in its family to display such small and highly concentrated photophores. The strawberry squid mainly uses its photophores for two purposes, counter-illumination and concealing prey. In counter-illumination, the squid produces blue light from its photophores so that, when viewed above, it blends in with the sunlight coming downwards and effectively erases its silhouette. This type of bioluminescence is characterized by consistent light production, in contrast to bioluminescence used for concealing prey, which is characterized by short bursts of intense light or flashes. Although the exact purpose for this particular use of bioluminescence is unknown, the heavily pigmented oral cavity and interbrachial membrane of the strawberry squid and some other squids suggest that luminescence by the prey threatens the predator in some way. Of course, I will have photos of her. She's absolutely stunning. Check out mistressofthemacabrepodcast.com or social media. And that is it for today's episode, part three of Killer Fashion and Beauty. And we will wrap it up next week. And until then, stay out of fucking trouble for once in your goddamn life. Okay, bye. Full source notes are available at mistressofthemacabrepodcast.com as well as photos pertaining to each episode. Follow along on Instagram for all the insane and gory photos at Mistress of the Macabre Podcast. Please leave a five-star rating and review wherever you get your podcasts. It really helps the show grow, and I will love you forever. And tell a friend, if you even have any. Bonus content is available at patreon.com or on Apple Podcast subscriptions. I'm just one young teenage girl writing, researching, producing, editing, and recording the show. Your support goes a long way. If you have topic ideas, questions, comments, animal facts, or unsettling stories you'd like to share, email me at mistressofthemacabrepodcast at gmail.com.